<laughs> He'd heard my theme songs on these, so he doesn't know me to. <laughs> you notice the shrug of the shrug. <laughs> Well, I, I tell something about my own research interests. I had a few rather interesting things that fell my way. And uh, I began as an undergraduate. I was fortunate in, as an undergraduate. I came under the influence of a man who uh, was unbelievably sharp on the subject of insects, uh, Dwight Isley. And he took an interest in me uh, to well, I, I think it's a whole lot like football coaches get interested in a kid that plays football and he wants to send him on to college and somewhere else. Well, Isley had that similar kind of interest in me. And uh, he helped plan my course of evolution along with things academic. But Isley was a, I was his gopher in the laboratory, worked in the insectary in the morning and the afternoon. He'd take me out to the field and we'd sit on a stump or a log or somewhere else and talk insects all afternoon, and I learned to recognize the insects by the way they flew or where they sat or what they did, and then incidentally all about Babe Ruth and baseball, that was his other hobby. And I, I learned more about baseball, than I, which I promptly forgot, but I did, <laughs> I did retain the information on, on the insects, which were, have been invaluable to me all these years. Uh, and believe it or not, he stimulated me to produce two research papers as an undergraduate, both of which got published. And strangely enough, about three or four weeks ago, I got a request from some lady that he wanted to know if I still had any reprints. <laughs> and since nobody else had ever heard of it, I still had a few. <laughs> and the second one was on grasshoppers. Grasshoppers back in the late 20s and all, they were, they were something to behold. And during the 30s, they were worse. And I had a lot of fun with this thing as an ecological one. It was a hillside. These things don't amount to anything. They're, they're a little piddling uh, types of things, but it was surely fascinating to me back in those days. And that's what makes it important. It isn't what you think about it some other day. This hill had a trees that went up. It was a sizable hill. Uh, Oh, probably two or three hundred feet high. It was a prairie on one end and a forest on the other. And you had now a change in elevation, of course, moisture and everything else with this. And uh, as you know, species come to be because environments are different. And this environment would change as you went up the hill over the grassland, as you went up the hill over the, the uh, woodland, the species would change. That meant I had to learn taxonomy, and that meant I had to know morphology before I could do the taxonomy, and so on. So that it, it was a whole education in itself. In the meantime, I could get out and do nothing away from the laboratory and get paid for it. Twenty-five cents an hour. <laughs> and then I went on for a master's degree in, out in Kansas, and I, again, was fortunate in the man that I worked with. And in that case, I worked on underground insects. I should have applied for a grave digger society after the I dug, in connection with it, I dug 130 holes two feet by three feet by six feet deep uh, all over that prairie out there chasing <laughs> underground insects. Uh, and some of the places, the people go dig them up. They, they fill the holes back up, and it did look, look like a small grave. And then they go dig those things up all over. I had to spend as much time refilling the graves that I had dug. Well, that's an incident. I was still in the rookie class. At, uh, I was in graduate school at the time, but I was working this summer, my first year. I was working this summer in the rice country in central Arkansas, working on rice water weevil. And I, again, was the gopher for the man who was working on it. But we had a problem with chinch bugs and rice, something that hadn't made the literature anywhere. And here I was, the only, they heard the word entomology attached. I wasn't an entomologist by any means, I was really a rookie. And they got the name, and the county agent came out after me and says, I've got troubles with chinch bug in rice field. <coughs> well, rice, as you know, is flooded with water, and chinch bugs have got no business in rice field, but you do have to drain rice to uh, harvest it. They had drained this rice right next to a 600 acres of pasture land that had dried up. 
The chinch bugs moved out of that pasture into that rice uh, field. Looked like an endless belt. You walk out there in the ground, looked as if it was all going toward in the direction of the rice field. Well, I knew the routines of what you're supposed to do with this in wheat country and corn country up in the Middle West, but I didn't know anything about what you're supposed to do with it in the rice country. But I did know, fortunately, I learned principles and not just the details. And the principle was, if you can get a barrier between them, between the place where they're coming from and where they're going, and it's a good enough one, it'll stop them. So this fellow had a canal running along on the side of that field, and I said, well, let's put some weirs down that canal. The canal, of course, was sloped so that the water would run down it. A weir is a dam. They put in some wooden dams across this water. And pump, the rice people don't mind throwing water around it. They, they pump it all over the place. So he pumped this uh, ditch full of water, and chinch bugs come up to it and shake their heads and turn around and go in the other direction and save his rice field. And I was pleased to be able to accomplish that. It was a minor matter, but to a kid, Coming along, a thing of that sort gives you a, a certain amount of boost that you've done something with your particular knowledge that they couldn't do. I had another instance of this sort. This old boy, he was an influential politician. You run into that too in this field. And he knew, uh, he said, you can't control cotton bowl people. It's utterly impossible. And he was telling it everywhere and giving the university fits for their stand that it could be done. Well, I was downstate. Uh, this is the University of Arkansas. I was downstate uh, and uh, I was told to do something about this uh, cotton boll weevil problem. I, I knew what boll weevil was and vaguely what it did, but I didn't know much else about it. So I went to the, out to the field and I found that he had about 100 acres of cotton and there were three different stages of the infestation in this field, a total of about 14 acres out of the 100 that was involved. And half a day I'd found where they were and what the stage they were in, and I told him what to do with these things and at what interval to do it. Well, they got perfect control of their bowl wheel, as luck would have it. And then he's told all over the country there's nothing to control. <laughs> it's true if you do the right thing. <clears throat> but I got interested in mosquitoes with this work in rice fields, and if you know anything about rice, that's a great place for mosquitoes. I was running one trap one night, and I caught 180,000 female mosquitoes in this trap in one night. I would have got more, but it's, they clogged up the trap and stopped it. <laughs> and, <clears throat> uh, that's a lot of mosquitoes. That's two or three gallons. If you measure them that way, that's about the only way to do it in rice country. And that's where I learned that all mosquitoes don't lay their eggs in little fancy uh, rafts on the surface of water, fly off and leave them. I, that's all I knew about a mosquito at that particular time. I've confused the literature a lot more since then. But I walked up through this rice field from the low end of it up toward the well, which is of course always on the high ground. And uh, of course, the water gravity feeds down the field to the low end of it. And <clears throat> I noticed by the time I got up to the well that the whole rice population of mosquitoes had changed in the field at Wigglers from very small ones way down at the far end of the field to very pupae and fourth end star and pupae up at the upper end. And I said, Now, there's something going on here that isn't right. This field hadn't been flooded long enough for. Uh, such things as this to happen and what's going on. I didn't know that that kind of mosquito put its eggs on the ground before the flooding. Then the water comes on there and hatches the eggs and away they go. And that started me on to the floodwater mosquito business, which I continued after I came here. And I mentioned two instances. One is, since these things are in eggs most of the year, you had to find the stage of the mosquitoes that would be the egg stage that most of the year so that you could assess the population. And finding these eggs turned out to be quite a trick. Uh, Dr. Wallabauer was 